Hi, great to see you, Jennifer. How are you doing today? I'm good, Paul. It's nice talking to you. Yeah, this is great. I appreciate it. You know, we started this new series of interviewing our friends and experts and colleagues that, that we work with across the industry and couldn't think of anyone better to uh, start this off with and to, to talk to my good friend Jennifer uh, Ulrich, who's the director of advisory at CoreCentric. And she and her colleagues support companies across all areas of procurement and finance transformation, which are many of you have, have come across CoreCentric in, in your time. Um, so before we get started, Jen, and we're gonna talk about, I think a really timely and important topic of supplier diversity. Can you tell us a little bit more about the work you do at CoreCentric and CoreCentric in general? Sure, sure. So I'm actually the senior director of our advisory group here at CoreCentric. And CoreCentric is a global provider of uh, market leading source to pay order to cash and fleet solutions. So we actually help organizations from the mid market all the way through Fortune 1000 um, by delivering strategic consulting services, technology and managed services that really focus on reducing costs uh, to help improve working capital. So you know, as I mentioned, I lead the advisory group, and really what we do is we help organizations across the source to pay spectrum to make better decisions on, um, you know, how to improve the role of procurement and finance across their people, processes, tools, technology, kind of, you name it, we're there to help, um, you know, businesses do better, better business. Excellent. That's fantastic. And we're at Vendor Center. We're very fortunate to, to work with Jen and her team. Uh, we've had a great collaborations uh, over the last few years and mm -hmm. look to many more collaborations in the in the future. Um, so, you know, I know that CoreCentric has worked on supplier diversity for a long time. Um, can you share some insights about kind of the work you do with supplier diversity and also, you know, anything, you know, given the, the current environment and, and movement towards racial injustice and equality. I know it's been a really heightened topic in the news, but I know you've been working on this for a very long time. Sure, sure. So uh, more broadly, we help organizations to set up supplier diversity programs. So one component of helping with people and processes to is to establish some customized programs. And that could be pretty much anything across the board from sustainability to supplier diversity. Um, you know, obviously, that's where we're able to plug in vendor centric from a third party risk standpoint. So we have a lot of great partnerships from that aspect where, where we rely on organizations like yourselves to, to give us some strength there. But but when it comes to supplier diversity, again, what we can do is help organizations from the ground up to set up policy, procedure, um, establish an organizational structure to support that program going forward, but also the, the data and analytics component from a reporting standpoint, um, both just from the sort of overarching how to set up the metrics and reporting, but also by providing the technology to support that as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I think, you know, we hear a lot about what's going on in the economy and these events that have had an impact on supplier diversity. And, and I think corporations are really starting to have a stronger emphasis on developing these programs or at least ensuring that the programs they have in place are properly resourced and paid attention to. So a lot of organizations have done this over time. And, you know, we, we see that, you know, either it doesn't get quite the attention it needs, it doesn't get the top level executive support. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, you know, if you look at you know some of the surveys online, one of the biggest challenges that procurement functions note uh, when, as it relates to their supplier diversity program is a lack of resources and getting the budget and funding to, to put into this. Yeah. Um, but I think, uh, so that's where I like to look at, you know, what's going on right now from a positive perspective that the corporations are starting to pay attention to these things again. Um, you know, I just hope that, you know, the majority of them will maintain this when once right. they settle down, um, you know, like any kind of economically driven, you know, trend, we see, you know, real big surge all of a sudden because it's a popular thing to do or it's the, the right, you know, it mm -hmm. looks good on paper, right? Um, you know, executives, even boards, boards of directors are steering their corporations towards supplier diversity programs for obvious reasons, but over time, um, they have a challenge evaluating the, the the cost versus the benefit for putting in place this type of program. And I'd say <clears throat> that's also a pretty big challenge for supplier diversity is being able to directly connect the dots between the value the program brings um, mm -hmm. based on the resources and effort you put into building one and maintaining it over time. 
Yeah, that, that's really, those are great insights. Thank you. And, and I know in just the work we do, we do a lot of work in highly regulated industries. And obviously, mm-hmm. supplier diversity has been a part of regulations uh, for right. a number of years. And yeah, obviously trying to drive uh, more collaboration with minority women and veteran-owned businesses. Um, and so I, I think it does, you know, it does provide a unique opportunity in that there, there are different perspectives and everyone comes at it with different life experiences. And so I think I'd be curious what, if you have any thoughts about, you know, how that, you know, could play a role in, in innovation, you know, both in the domestic and global supply chain. I know with veterans, I mean, there's a lot of expertise built while people are in the military mm-hmm. and then they bring that expertise out to the private industry. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I think you can come from all different angles. And I think, you know, in order to answer that properly, you have to consider what corporations are doing right now to diversify their supply chains in general. So you talk about mitigating risk. Um, we're seeing a lot of that happen, uh, you know, and it actually started obviously before COVID uh, mm-hmm. with a lot of the, the Trump administration and the, and the tariffs and everything. So you have all these businesses that have already been putting in place strategies to pull out of China and, you know, what that's done is actually, it's a, a couple different things, right? So they've been able to, move into other overseas emerging markets, giving Mm -hmm. new markets, uh, you know, uh, a new chance uh, to bring opportunity to the table where they may have been overshadowed by those Chinese suppliers historically. So while they're not diverse per se, but it's opening up the global supply chain to a lot of new opportunities. Mm -hmm. The other sort of more tangential impact is the localization of the supply chain. So definitely as a result of COVID, we saw organizations looking to their local suppliers, their local small and diverse suppliers to be able to supplement what they weren't able to get through China or or other um, overseas providers due to some of the delays in logistics and supply chain, um, sort of as a you know dotted line impact from COVID. So mm-hmm. again, it's kind of taking a bad say, situation and, and looking at it from a positive perspective. And I think, you know, Hopefully, um, companies are starting to see that those small, diverse suppliers can provide a lot more agility and flexibility to the supply chain. And, you know, when you think about kind of the balancing of it, while the unit costs of products overseas may be lower, the total cost of ownership may actually even out when you look at a more local supplier that has a lower lower cost to ship those products, mm-hmm. as, as well as the lead times being shorter. So it, it's really challenging procurement to think of it differently and and build a strategy around how you balance uh you know supplementing the supply chain and wherever possible building a dual source strategy that's more long term and not just reactive based on what's going on right now in the environment yeah that's that's really interesting i mean i I think that's that's one of the challenges across all business functions Mm -hmm. is to constantly be reevaluating and reassessing new ways of of analyzing and strategizing to achieve things because mm-hmm. it's not always the straight path. It's not always you know what we think the lowest cost is. As you said, there's a lot of different factors to take into account. And so it's interesting to hear you talk about that. Kind of the last thing before we wrap up, I'm curious, you know, I've been seeing, as I'm sure you have in the in, in TV and on social media, a lot of news from the big brands, you know, the big international companies. Mm-hmm. I mean, you see it in their TV commercials, but but you also see it, you know, in board representation and right. uh, really taking this diversity to the next level. So curious if you've had any additional, um, you know, behind the scenes insights about kind of some of the, 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 the big brands, you know, what they're, how they're really looking at this. And to your point, is it sustainable? Is it something right. they're actually integrating to their businesses or is this more of a trend kind of thing that they're, they're kind of, you know, leading with some marketing buzz and things like that, and it's not really integrated into the business. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's interesting that you say that. You know, when you think about the leading brands, you know, a lot of the top brands are already doing this, have already been doing this for a very long time. Johnson & Johnson, Hilton, Kaiser Permanente, CVS. It is ingrained in their culture. They've been doing mm. it for a really long time. I've actually even seen they won't even do business with with some non-diverse suppliers in certain categories. That's how strong it is in their culture. And what I'm wow. actually hoping to see from this is not so much about what the big brands are doing, but but what what everybody else does, right? Yeah. yeah. So take take from you know lead by example, you know yeah. that, and and hopefully it'll have an impact. 
because oftentimes, like you said before, when it comes to uh, a lot of the federal organizations or regulated organizations that have to do this, you know, we're going to see more organizations that are driven by, you know, the corporate social responsibility aspect of it. Um, and hopefully that over time, you know, those the other competing priorities and resources don't get shifted away because they just can't see the value of it. I think mm-hmm. that's what people are looking to our company to do and other, you know, similar consulting firms is, is help us show the value, help us prove the business case of why we need to do this, because it is a really, really important aspect of, of supply chain and, and doing business and, and not just from the cost savings aspect of it, but the ethical, you know, the yeah. responsibility of it. Absolutely. Well, it's great. I really appreciate the time we spent today, Jen. As I said, Jennifer, I, I can't think of anyone better to, to have our first discussion with yeah. and what we hope to be a long series of, of, of highlighting some great experts out in the marketplace that, that we collaborate with and we learn from and, and work with. So uh, thanks so much for your insights. I hope you have a great day. You too. Thanks so much, right. Paul. I appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.